Stephen, this tonight, let us begin awkwardly <laughs> by giving you a nice backhanded compliment. Congratulations, sincerely, <laughs> on Pacific Rim Uprising. A much better directed film than the previous one. <laughs> Can you tell me about the point of distinction and the way you directed this film as compared to the previous film? What did you bring to this movie that's different? Uh, well, first and foremost, I I've been a huge Guillermo del Toro fan ever since Kronos. Um, I think his visual style is, is unmatched among directors with years and years and years of experience. Mm. Coming into this, I knew there's no way I can match Guillermo's visual style. He, he is unique among filmmakers. Um, what I wanted to bring to it, it was what I grew up loving. I, I'm a child of the 70s and 80s, so I grew up with Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back and Raiders of the Lost Ark and, and all those fun Ray Harryhausen movies. So I really wanted to bring that kind of fun uh, uh, to the movie and, and make it feel almost like a bit of an 80s throwback in a way uh, while using modern technology. Um, so fun was the number one thing okay. that I wanted to bring. I'm going to shove a compliment down your throat. <laughs> I felt that your direction had much more cadence in it. It might be a function of the story, the nature of the story, but there was much more ebb and flow, much more lightness and darkness in it, whereas I felt that the previous film was a bit monotonal. This is just a critical opinion. What do you reckon? Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, um, and I've, I've also have to, I have to tip my hat to Joss Whedon for that, because my work with him on Buffy and Angel really taught me the importance of that kind of lightness and darkness and how you can have a really gut-wrenching serious moment and throw in something funny in the reverse. You can have uh, something funny going on with a serious moment. Uh, I'm very lucky to have learned from the master. Now, how true is this statement that without Transformers, we wouldn't have had Pacific Rim? Um, I don't know. I, I, I actually think without RoboJocks, you might not have had Pacific Rim, if anybody remembers that old movie. Uh, it was like one of the first mech movies way back in, in the 80s. Um, to me, I, I, think, I think a movie like this was almost inevitable um, to have, once you look at especially the Japanese culture, um, with Gundam and series like that about, uh, you know, humans getting inside yes. these giant metal beasts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's something that's just, it's so much fun. Sure. Um, and it, it's what distinguishes it from, uh, I think, uh, Transformers, mm. is that there are actually people inside them. That, but that to, very, humans. to very politely press the point, <laughs> it was Michael Bay who opened up that market. I mean, those films have made about a billion dollars each. Oh, yes. And although he is unfairly used as a punchline, surely he deserves credit for the accomplishments of those films and that the taste for big fighting robots was established by him. Is Without a doubt, especially that first movie, which mm. I thought was absolutely a delight. And, and what he did uh, and what ILM did with the effects, I think really, really did open up people's eyes of what was possible. Now, this is a big topic. We've got to talk about China. Yes. Because this film, I think, uh, in many regards, is the future. The future is here. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of China in this movie. Yes. How important was China to the making of Pacific Rim Uprising? It was, it was important. It was one of the biggest markets of the first movie, and, and we definitely wanted to lean into that. Uh, thankfully, for this story, it was never forced down my throat. Uh, it was natural to the DNA of the story, since it's the Pacific Rim, it's the fighting force, and, and I love bringing in different cultures into the movie. Uh, one thing I really wanted to continue with what Guillermo and Travis Beecham did was the idea that it's a world fighting force. Um, so instead of setting it in Hong Kong this time, we set it in Mo Yulan, which is off the coast of China, and we have a, China, a Chinese tech billionaire played by Zhang Tian it is uh, as one of the main characters. It is a signal, though, of the, the rise of the Chinese market and mm -hmm. the importance of the Chinese market. Pacific Rim was a hit in China, yes. which is the reason why you're getting to make, you got to make a sequel. That's true, isn't it? Very true, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, again, this is a serious question. Do you think that the Chinese love, adoration for American film actually is a good thing for world peace? 
<laughs> in that the likelihood of going to war or having conflict with another country who loves your culture is less likely than the opposite. Yeah, you know, I was actually having a conversation about this the other day, about talking about the, the global market and how, how movies have to be, uh, movies of this size have to be international hits uh, to help pay for them because they're so expensive. And I was talking about how the exchange of cultural ideas and ideals through movies is very, very powerful. Now, ultimately, I think it's the governments that go to war. It's not the common people that may like each other's movies. But yes, I think, it, I think it's very helpful for uh, the Chinese populace to see Western movies in the reverse, for the Western audience to see Chinese movies, because the Chinese um, uh, film machine is really cranking up. I mean, they're making fantastic movies that are doing very, very well over there. Two more questions for you. Mm -hmm. Firstly, time's not allowing me to, to give you the due respect you deserve for having spent all your career at the heart of fanboy culture. <laughs> Just tell me quickly, how important fanboy culture is and how big it is and why it's so big. Fanboy culture is absolutely important. First and foremost, before I got a chance to do everything that I've been doing, I, I was a fanboy. Um, I grew up loving genre. I grew up reading comics and watching movies and playing video games. So for, for me, a fanboy at heart to get to do this, uh, you know, I just, I, more than anything, I'll, I want my love of this genre to pour out onto the screen with everything I do. And without that fan community, none of these movies would be made. Because uh, okay. ultimately it's about, uh, you've got you've to make a profit. Well, the love and the passion certainly comes through. I'm stealing my last question for you. You joke about breaking secrecy, about when people ask you about Marvel products and so on, and presumably about any other non-disclosure uh, a statement that you uh, uh, sign, but those non-disclosure clauses are serious, aren't they? Oh, they're serious. Yeah. When uh, you say yes. that Marvel will murder you in your bed, yes, you're only slightly joking, aren't you? I'll tell a quick story. I was uh, I was shooting the finale of uh, season one of Daredevil, and I was working over Thanksgiving all alone in a in a hotel room in Brooklyn. And I got my iPhone and I put it up to the peephole in my door and took a picture, a very distorted picture out there. And I said, you know, this is the only view I get during Thanksgiving and I'm happy to do it to, uh, to work on Daredevil. I am not kidding you. Two minutes later, my phone rings and it's Marvel saying, what are you doing? I go, well, he goes, don't, don't post that picture. People will figure out where we are by, by that picture. <laughs> so it was that fast. They are no joke. 